All right. Good, e good evening, everyone. Uh, so my name is Ethan Neal. I'm an associate professor of physics here at CU Boulder. Uh, I'm one of the local directors of TASI, uh, together with my colleagues Oliver DeWolf and Tom DeGrand in the back. Uh, we also have uh, scientific organizers who help with the program every year. So we have a Professor Tong Yan Lin uh, from UC San Diego with us tonight uh, up in the balcony. So just before we start, uh, I want to say a couple words about TASI, uh, what it is. So TASI is an acronym. It stands for the Theoretical Advanced Study Institute in Elementary Particle Physics. And what it is is a summer program for advanced graduate students uh, who are doing research in particle physics. We have 65 of them. Uh, every summer from the U.S. and from around the world. Uh, and this is an ongoing institution. It was founded way back in 1984, uh, and we've been hosting it here at CU Boulder since 1989. Uh, and one of the traditions of TASI every year is this lecture, is the public lecture, because we, we just, uh, the school, there's just so much excitement about all the research, everything that's going on in particle physics, and we want to share a little bit of that with you uh, in the community. Uh, and so uh, we always have one of our lectures at the school give the lecture, uh, today, it's our uh, pleasure to have Dr. Benjamin uh, Nachman, uh, who's from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, so Dr. Nachman got his PhD from Stanford in 2016 uh, under Dong Su and Ariel Schwartzman. Uh, then he went on to a postdoc at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, uh, where he's been ever since. He started on as a permanent staff member in 2020. And his research focuses on uh, machine learning for data analysis, in particular at colliders. Um, he's a member of the ATLAS collaboration, which is one of the big experiments located at the Large Hadron Collider uh, in Geneva. Uh, and there's been just an explosion of, of interest, obviously, in AI, machine learning recently. Um, as I'm sure Ben will mention, particle physicists have been using uh, machine learning methods for a long time uh, in experiments since the 80s. Uh, and this has been sort of a major theme of this uh, year's program for the summer school, has been sort of machine learning as, as a theme within the sort of broader context of particle physics, and so we're really happy to have uh, Dr. Nachman lecturing about that and also giving us this uh, public lecture about exploring fundamental interactions with AI. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, it's fantastic to, to uh, be in front of all of you and talk about uh, this exciting topic. Um, before I get too far, I'm going to tell you what the title means. Um, so I'll talk about fundamental interactions in just a second. Um, but you, you notice that I use the word AI here. And uh, Ethan also interchangeably used the word machine learning. And I'm going to use the two as synonyms, uh, although for some people they're not synonyms. One might think AI is somehow a bigger class that includes machine learning. But here I'm thinking about any tools that can automatically identify structure and data. That's what I mean here. And uh, the exact details of what's AI and what's machine learning and what's deep learning is not so important for, for what comes next. OK. But now I have to tell you what I mean by fundamental interactions. Um, so this is a really exciting time. There are a lot of deep questions, theoretical questions, experimental questions that we don't understand that are motivating a deep exploration of the fundamental structure of, of nature. So what do I mean by fundamental structure of nature? So here's a picture of an atom. It's not to scale. Um, <laughs> and you can see there's, there's the electrons. I guess there are three of them. They're orbiting in their very classical way around the nucleus, which is this purple blob. And the nucleus itself is composed of protons and neutrons. And those protons and neutrons are themselves not elementary. Uh, they are composed of quarks. So the proton is composed of two up quarks and a down quark, has a net charge of plus one. And the neutron is composed of two down quarks and an up quark. It's net neutral. OK, so this is, uh, as far as we can tell, the fundamental constituents of basically everything uh, around us. There's the electrons and the up quarks and the down quarks. OK, so that's like you know, our, our building blocks of matter. Um, and if that were the end, probably we would just go home and be done. Um, but apparently, there's a copy of that. Um, we have not only uh, up quarks, down quarks, electrons, there's also charm quarks, strange, quark, strange quarks, and muons. And they're basically exactly the same as this first column, except they're more massive. Um, and we don't know why there are two of them. But not only are there two of them, there's actually three of them. Um, so this is sort of like the periodic table of elementary particles, as far as we can tell. And um, why are there three? Uh, we'd have no idea. Um, and so this is one of the deep mysteries. And I'm going to tell you a few more um, just to give you a sense of like what I mean by the kinds of questions we want to ask when I talk about fundamental interactions. OK, so that's one question about the matter particles. Why are there three copies? Um, uh, OK, then there are other questions about the forces between particles. So for instance, even in my previous picture, I committed a sin. I, I drew a neutron as two down quarks and an up quark in the triangle. Um, okay, and that's like if you just Google neutron, you see a picture like the one here, that's what you look. You see two down quarks and an up quark. 
But as far as we can tell, the quarks are not arranged like that. The, uh, it's more like this. Um, and that's where the electric dipole moment of a neutron, which uh, just, that's what it means, is like, you know, that's reality, we don't know why. Okay, so that's another, yeah, mystery. Um, but we have other sources of mysteries, not just the ones that we can examine in a lab. Uh, for instance, uh, apparently, um, the matter that we, we are composed of, the, the electrons, the up quarks, and the down quarks, constitute a tiny fraction of, of all the matter in the universe. Uh, so this is a picture of two uh, clusters of galaxies that are colliding, and the pinkish bits are the visible matter, the stuff that's composed of us, that's luminous, that makes light that we can see, and the purplish bits are, is some mysterious component that, as far as we can tell, interacts gravitationally, but not in other ways with the other matter. So this is the dark matter. And it's, there's way more dark matter, almost five times as much dark matter as there is regular matter, and we don't know what it's made out of. We know it exists from looking up in the sky, but we have no idea what it's made out of um, in the fundamental point of view of particles. Okay, so that's a huge question. Um, and there are other questions. So, for instance, um, not only is this not the complete picture, there are three copies, there's actually an additional copy. So for every particle we have, there's an antiparticle. So the electron has an anti-electron called the positron. That's the only special name. All the other ones are called anti-this and anti-that. So there's like the anti-up, the anti-charm, and, and so on. And so, yeah, who ordered that? Why are there, why are there, there's nine particles, that's weird, and there's also not just nine, there's actually 18. Okay, so that's weird. And not only is that weird, where is all the antimatter? Uh, we are in a room filled with matter. Um, but as far as we can tell, most of the physical processes that make stuff make matter and antimatter in almost equal proportions. But yet, we don't know where any of the antimatter went. So it's probably hiding somewhere, but as far as we can tell, we can't find it. Okay, so that's super weird also. So these are kind of the questions. And in order to uh, make progress, we have to ask big questions to get um, the answers we want from this. Okay, so that's the setting. Now how do we make progress? We make progress um, by asking the big questions, we want to interrogate nature. Okay, so I put nature on the top left there, and in order to, to interrogate nature, we perform experiments. So for instance, uh, we might collide particles. Um, colliding particles is great because we can, in the lab, synthetically make new matter. Um, but there are other ways of doing this that are kind of similar. So for instance, in addition to colliding particles in the lab, we can also have a giant vat of material and let the particles from space collide with, those, with, with the matter and, and, and look for reactions that way. There are all sorts of modalities of colliding particles with each other, or particles with matter, in order to see if we can see what's going on. So that's, that's the experimental part. We do the collisions. Then we wanna see what happens. So we collide the particles and we build giant detectors in order to capture all the outgoing products of this collision. And um, it's a little hard to see from this picture, but uh, this is the, the, the guts of the Atlas detector, which is one of the detectors at the Large Hadron Collider. It's the one I work on. And there's a, a, a guy standing there. He's actually a pretty tall guy. Um, and he's really small in this picture because the Atlas detector is a five-story building 100 meters below ground in Geneva, Switzerland. And we have you know, the equivalent of like tens to hundreds of micron precision um, over this whole um, uh, apparatus, which is kind of crazy. But that's required in order to understand exactly what happened in the collision debris that flies out from this uh, um, detector. Okay, so then what we wanna do is we have the particles produced, we measure them in our detector, and then we want to go back to particles. We want to infer what were the particles before the detector. And the detector sort of gives us a noisy version of all the outcomes, and we want to identify the particles so that we can do a statistical analysis. And the way that works is that this is sort of a cross-section of what a detector at the Large Hadron Collider might look like. So this point right here is where the particles collide. They collide into and out of the page, and you're seeing a transverse view. So a particle uh, like the muon, this teal line, it would fly out like that, and you see there's other particles here, um, like an electron and, and other particles. And each of these different components are layers. So these detectors are sort of like um, uh, many, many cylinders. I usually think about them as like onions although onion is like the wrong geometry. It's more like a, uh, more like a leak, I guess. So they're like a leak, you know, uh, cylindrical geometry, and um, with many, many layers, and each time a particle goes through a given layer, it leaves a little bit of energy. And then we use all the little energy bits to reconstruct the trajectory of the particles, and so in that way, we can go from the um, very high dimensional detector readout back down to the level of particles. So we have particles, the detector, back to particles. And we wanna study these particles to see what happened. Okay, and the way we do that is we compare our data with a theory. And what we wanna eventually do is say which of the theories matches the data. And we do that by running the same procedure on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, on a computer. So 
we can simulate the reaction. We can simulate, say, two protons colliding. They produce some stuff. That stuff flies apart and produces particles ahead of detector. We can do that. Um, uh, that's where all the particle physics comes into play. Then those particles hit a detector, and they interact with the detector. They leave energy. And that's where sort of the nuclear physics comes into play. And we have very detailed simulations of all the interactions of the particles with the detectors until they're stopped or until they escape beyond the detector. And then we have to do this reconstruction step again. And basically, the output of the detector and the simulated detector look identical. You can, in fact, give them to an expert uh, experimentalist, and they will not be able to distinguish them. Um, so it's really we have really precise, pristine simulations. And we can run the same software on both sides to get two collections of particles. We have the, the real particles and the simulated particles. And then what we want to do is we want to compare them. And we want to then do the comparison or to do the statistical analysis to infer you know, which theory is correct. Now, these collections of particles are really uh, complicated to look at. You might have a given event could have thousands or tens of thousands of particles. Each of those particles has a momentum, so that's three numbers, momentum in the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction, plus like an electric charge and possibly other properties. So we're talking 10,000 or 100,000 dimensional space. And I don't know about you, but I cannot visualize a 10,000 dimensional space. And so what we usually do is we first compress. And we take that high dimensional space and we turn it into a one dimensional space, uh, or two or three, but let's say one. One is the most common. So we take the, all the particles and we turn it into one number, a summary statistic it's called. That's the fancy name. Um, but we can, I'm gonna, I can call it compression, it's the same thing. And we make uh, a, a picture like this, which is a histogram. So this histogram says how often uh, in a given range of that uh, compressed value do I observe, say, the data um, or uh, the simulation. So I have like the simulation is like the filled bars, like the frequency, and the, the, the dots with the error bars are like the data. And so this would be like a very typical thing we would look at. We'd have one observable which summarizes all the data for a given collision, and I would have many, many collisions so I can fill a histogram. The histogram is basically how often does a given event uh, produce an observable value in a given range of, of, uh, of this observable. OK, so then I have these, these, uh, this histogram, and I could have multiple theories. Theory one, theory two, theory three. And for each theory, I can run the whole process. I can simulate the collisions, the detector, the reconstruction. I make my histogram. And in, in these three cases, the data are the same. All I've changed are the histogram, uh, the, the, the filled red one. And so now I have the same data, and I have three different theories. And I can ask the question, which theory is most consistent with the data? OK. And so I can say, like, let's say here is theory number, whatever that means. And the y-axis is how good, how, how compatible are they? More compatible is better. And I see, oh, well, um, the middle one is the most compatible. And I declare that theory the correct one. And I am very excited. OK. So success. ka -ching. OK. Very good. So that's basically how data analysis goes um, at the Large Hadron Collider and elsewhere. Um, we used basically this procedure, for instance, to discover the Higgs boson and do a lot of other data analysis. And um, it's very effective, um, but there's one critical challenge, which is that I'm taking this very high dimensional space, all the particles, and I'm compressing it into one dimension. And uh, that is throwing away a lot of information. Um, I'm going from many thousands of, of numbers per event to a single number, or if I'm lucky, two or three. And so basically, um, I'm, I'm basically throwing away information and that's fundamentally limiting the kind of uh, precision I can achieve with these complex data. OK. So I've been talking for 15 minutes. Uh, yes, please. Right, so the question is, I'm making some, some assumption about the distribution. So the way it's done, the, the way it's done here is that, um, let me go back here for a second. So I have, once I decide what the uh, compression is what the observable is. Uh, I can run it through both of my chains, and I can simulate a bunch of data. And the red here is a histogram made from the simulation. So I'm not assuming anything about the distribution other than that I can simulate it. So I know it implicitly, if that makes sense. So I'm, I can run the simulation, I can make my synthetic collisions, and then I can you know, fill this histogram for the simulation and for the data and compare them. Of course, it's much cheaper to run a synthetic collider than a real collider. And so I can have much more simulated data than the real data. All right. OK, so I've been talking for 15 minutes. And uh, you all came here. Oh, yeah, please. Um, these parameters that make the classes complicated. So, so if something 
The question is, am I, am I, can I have degeneracies? Could I have two different theories that are equally consistent with the data? And uh, the answer is absolutely. Uh, that's a problem. Yeah. OK. Uh, so I've been talking for now a little bit over 15 minutes. And you all came here because you were excited about AI. I haven't talked about AI yet, so I should really get to that. Um, so probably you already knew the punchline. I've been building up to uh, the challenges that we have to summarize. And let's get rid of summaries with machine learning. OK. So that is what I want to tell you about now is uh, we want to use the um, AI to directly compare the high dimensional spaces, the level of particles, without summarizing. And that will allow us to not have to throw away any information, which can allow us to achieve better precision and utilize you know, more information to have the, the most precise um, uh, statistical analysis possible. OK. And this is really enabling new science we couldn't imagine before. It's not just like, oh, it's a little bit better because now we have more information. We're going from like one feature to 1,000 features. And we can ask questions that we just didn't know how to ask before. Um, and I'm, I, my goal today is to give you some sense of that. Um, but I'm going to have some basic ground rules. I'm going to try to avoid having equations. I'm going to try to avoid having too many lines of code. Um, and I'm going to try to avoid having too many neural network architectures. Um, but I hope, given those constraints, I can convey at least some sense of the, the power of these tools. OK. Um, and this is a picture of a neural network. Um, so for those of you who haven't seen it yet, what is a neural network? A neural network is uh, a function that takes inputs and gives you outputs. And it does so by uh, taking, taking inputs and mapping them to other outputs, and then mapping those outputs to other outputs and repeating it and repeating it. So those are called the, the nodes of the neural network. Um, uh, sometimes people evoke like a brain with different inputs and outputs. My wife is a neuroscientist. I am contractually obligated to not mention neuroscience. Um, so I'm not going to talk about the brain. It is just a function. Um, and the function takes input, has other outputs, and it's just a very complicated function with many parameters. And for this perspective of this presentation, a neural network is simply a function that's very flexible and can fit very high dimensional data very well. OK. So um, hasn't industry already solved this problem? Why am I here talking about machine learning? Um, Ethan said I work on machine learning. Um, what, what can I contribute that hasn't been solved by pick your favorite tech company? Um, and I wasn't paid by these tech companies. I tried to be somewhat inclusive. So I'm really sorry if your favorite one's not included. OK. Um, and the answer, as you might have guessed, is a little bit of yes and a little bit of no. OK. Um, so of course, industry has provided amazing tools. And we're, of course, using those tools. Uh, so we're trying to adapt and deploy the state-of-the-art tools to the uh, best extent possible in order to solve the critical challenges that we face. On the other hand, uh, we also have unique challenges that industry isn't directly solving. And so there's uh, room for us to make progress on some areas that we need to solve because it's not going to be solved for us. And I want to spend a little bit of time now talking about what are some of those critical challenges that are unique to physics, or in this case, particle physics. OK. Um, so let's, uh, let's start with numbers. Um, numbers are pretty important for physics. I think we can all agree on that. OK. Um, so uh, let me start with, with numbers, and let me talk, talk about, um, say, uh, large language models. Um, so large language models would be like ChatGPT. Hopefully, you've all heard of ChatGPT. Um, if you haven't, uh, welcome to the 21st century. There's a really cool tool. It's called ChatGPT. You can talk to it, and it talks back to you, and it gives you a lot of information. OK. Um, so the core component of ChatGPT is called a transformer. A transformer is a neural network architecture that can process variable length inputs and give uh, variable length outputs which is pretty important because the way you talk to ChatGPT is you give it a sentence. Like, and a sentence could have a variable number of words, and they want to output a sentence, which also is a variable number of words. So that's what a transformer does. It takes a bunch of sentence, and it can process the, the context of the, the order of the words in the sentence, and it can output, say, another sentence. Okay. Um, and while our data aren't exactly language, they, they can look a little bit like a language in the sense that we have a variable length list of particles. So every time you collide protons, you get a, list of, you get a bunch of particles, and there's a variable number every time. So this is a picture uh, of a collision where the, the x-axis, or the, the, the collision axis is sort of this one, and there's the, the leak, um, and you can see all the particles going out. And so a given collision will have, you know, like I said, 10,000 or so particles. And so for a given collision, we have a list of all the particles and their properties. And it looks a bit like a sentence, so we could use a transformer-like architecture to parse these data. OK. Um, but um, uh, 
uh, here's an example of a question you can ask ChatGPT. So let's say I pick two random large numbers, uh, 389,836 times uh, 1,391,047. Okay, I ask it to multiply, and ChatGPT says, oh, you'd like me to multiply numbers, very good. I will multiply the numbers. This is the output of the multiplication, and it gives me that number. Okay, so, so that's great. It looks very credible. Um, that's a good number. I guess I'm kind of leading you on now. Um, so for those of you who whipped out your calculators to try to do it, you'll see that's actually the wrong number. Um, so um, it's pretty close. I mean, kudos to ChatGPT, um, but it's not correct. Um, and so uh, this is a problem because we care about numbers, and so it's not very good with numbers. Um, and that's a problem. Now, of course, you could ask ChatGPT, would you please go use a calculator and give me the number, and then it'll be correct, okay? Um, but we want it to understand like magnitudes and like relative frequency of numbers and things like that, and it's not very good at that. Okay, so we need uh, a widget to modify a classical transformer to understand numbers. Okay, so let me just give you a little um, hint of how that might look like. Um, so here's a picture of what something like ChatGPT does. So you give it a sentence. Uh, this mouse isn't the way. Let's get this out of the way. Uh, okay, so the, the sentence is five trials at pH 7.4. Okay, so that's uh, that's a sentence, and what? Uh, what it does is say, okay, I see all the words in the sentence. I'm going to assign what it calls a token to each of the words, and it takes those tokens and represents it in some abstract space, and then does some manipulation, and then it outputs, you know, some other numbers. Okay. Um, now, a traditional uh, encoding would have a special token for all the numbers, um, and then it would have just like it does for the letters. Um, but one way you could imagine ch changing that is you could have a special token for numbers and say. Uh, you know, basically, every time you see a number, you just scream "number," and then, um, and then, and then you, okay, you say it's a number. Um, and then, inside the abstract space, you can scale um, the size of that abstract representation by the number itself. And so, in that way, basically, it knows that numbers are continuous and they have an order because I've just imposed it. I've just said your abstract representation, every number gets number, and then I, you know, I scale it up or down by the actual number. Um, okay. So it turns out that works pretty well. Um, so here's an example where, um, for this particular example, it's an application to looking for a planetary orbit. So imagine you have a planet orbiting a distant star. Um, it's like exoplanets. And this particular value, A1, uh, represents one of the parameters of the orbit. Okay. Um, and so I want to understand, with this language model, um, the true value of that, um, that orbit given some data of measurements of the, of the planet around the star. Okay, so I, I give the ChatGPT or the specially trained ChatGPT some data um, in the form of a, you know, I've turned it into a sentence, so I can parse it, of, of data of the location of the planet around the star, and I say, tell me what the true value is. Okay, and so this is the inferred value, and that's the true value. Ideally, it would be one to one. That would be like, I got the right answer, okay. Um, now, all these different uh, jumpy ones are <coughs> classical encodings, classical ways of taking, making tokens out of the numbers. And you see that they jump around a lot, and that's because these tokens don't know about the continuity of numbers. Um, that's a general problem, is that you know, two and three don't necessarily need to be close compared to 10, okay? And so you see this, this jumpiness, whereas this blue one is this special one where it uses the num encoding and then you know, scales it. Um, and it knows that you know, it's, it's pretty close, but also it's sort of smooth, okay? Now this is for sure not, the, not necessarily the best way of doing it, but it is one way of doing it, invented by physicists to solve a problem that we cared about. And this is sort of part of a larger research program in order to adapt language models to be able to do the kind of things we need to do. Okay, so this was uh, unique solution number one to a problem that we have in physics. I have two more. Okay, the second one is that we have simulations. Um, now, uh, this is uh, pretty unique uh, because in industry, there's no generator of essays, although all the undergrads would love that. There's no generator of cats. Uh, you can just look up all the pretty cat pictures online. But we have to go out and look for the data. We can scrape the internet for essays and cats and whatever else. Um, but the, the models have to learn the structure of the data from the data. Um, we can't give it, um, there's no simulator of cats. I can't say, here's a bunch of cats. I know they're cats, so here's the cats. Uh, in contrast, um, we have simulations. We can simulate ab initio, which means like basically out of nothing. Um, we say, what are the fundamental parameters? And we can simulate the collisions. Okay, so this is like a picture of a simulated collision where these little pancakes here, these green blobs, represent the proton, which is composed of three 
quarks, those are the three lines here. You can imagine they're like moving through space. And, and they collide, and all the willow wiggly lines are gluons, and, and out go these other particles, and there are more pancakes. And so those particles hit a detector, and they form little blobs, and, and we do the whole thing. Um, and we're spanning a really vast range of length scale. So this kind of very highest energy interaction happens at roughly like 10 to the minus 20 meters, which is, I can't even imagine how small that is. And then the, the size of the detector are like meters. So we're spanning you know, 20 uh, um, orders of magnitude in length scale to describe this, this event, and we can really do it. And, and I promise I wouldn't have too many lines of, of, of programming here, but I had this one line of programming here just to illustrate you how cool it is. You can, you can really play God and say like, give me a collision of uh, protons collide and give me electrons. And okay, there, boom, done, I get it. Um, uh, and then um, if you want, for instance, you can say, well, I actually wanna see what happens if I change the electron mass, because like, why not, okay? so. You can have, that's, that line's a little more complicated, I'm sorry about that. But that line says change the electron mass from whatever it is to a little bit more, okay? And then you can re-simulate everything and then, you know, boom, you get your collisions and you can, you can examine them. Okay, so that's cool. So we don't have that for essays and we don't have that for cats. Um, so that gives us a new opportunity. Um, now there are some challenges. So, okay, so this means basically we can generate infinite labeled data. So labeled means I can generate a collision and I can tell you exactly what is in the collision because I made it. Um, as opposed to looking out and scraping cat pictures, like sometimes it's a cat and sometimes it's actually a hot dog, okay? Um, I guess it doesn't happen very often. Um, uh, there are these big billboards in San Francisco that like trying to advertise AI, and one of them is like dog versus hot dog, um, which I don't know, I guess it's supposed to be funny. Um, okay, so we basically have infinite labeled training data, and I put the infinite with a little tilde here, because actually some of the simulations, even though we can, we can do them and they're much cheaper than the actual collisions, they're still slow because we have to simulate all the microphysics processes and it's very slow to propagate all these particles through the detector. And so uh, this can actually be prohibitive and we actually sometimes use AI to also solve that problem. Um, and so uh, this is like m my favorite website to, if I have like, you know, I need to be distracted for a few minutes, there's this website called thispersondoesnotexist.com. Uh, don't go to it because it's just, it's addictive. Um, this is just, I refreshed twice, okay? And these are like pictures of people who don't exist. So the AI is just generating pictures of people. Um, and it's amazing, they, I mean, they look like super real people, right? But they're definitely not real. Um, so we can apply the same technology to uh, simulations of a detector, for instance. So the detector simulation is also super slow. And this, this um, bottom uh, row here uses the same uh, neural network as was used here um, to generate these. These are less interesting, they're just blobs, okay? But the blobs represent energy patterns inside a detector, and the bottom row are the neural network ones, and the top row are the ones from the physics simulator, the one that does takes forever and does all the microphysics and yada yada. Okay, so the top row and the bottom row, they look pretty similar. Um, and if you ask a physicist to compare them carefully and you do the right statistics, you see they're actually like basically the same. And so we can also use AI to solve problems with slow simulations. They're too slow, we can use AI to make them faster. Because for neural networks, it takes no time. Uh, to generate, basically it's way faster, it just skips all the physics parts and just gives right to the end, um, which is great. Okay, so that's now number two. I talked about uh, simulations, and now I'm gonna tell a third story, the third of my three examples, which I'm gonna call sculpting. And it's gonna take me a, a few minutes to explain what the problem is, but hopefully then you'll, you'll, you'll understand. Okay, so the context is looking for new particles. So one of the things we wanna do at the Large Hadron Collider and elsewhere is to look for new particles. So in this picture, which is a cutout, now we're like looking inside the leak of the Atlas detector. And these are like the, the, the protons collide this way and out goes the collision debris. And um, we wanna look for new particles that have a very high mass. And the reason we wanna look for new particles with a very high mass is if they had a lower mass, I would have seen them already, okay? So e equals mc squared, the more energy I pump in, the more mass I get. So I try to collide particles with as much energy as possible and I want to make the famous question mark particle, the one that's gonna send me to Stockholm, okay? And um, it's a beautiful particle, but we haven't seen it yet. Um, and let's say this particle decays and produces into, into quarks and gluons, and it produces these sprays of particles we call jets. These are jets. So jets are like collimated sprays of particles that are the result of quarks and gluons um, from very high energy particles. Okay, so we have the question mark particle, produces quarks and gluons, sprays of particles. Okay, so this is a beautiful kind of I want to see, I want to examine this kind of event and see was there the question mark particle. Okay, so the way we do that is we look at a histogram. Histogram is like the best friend of a particle physicist. The x-axis here would be like the mass. So I construct the mass of these two jets and I look to see um, if there's any features in the, in the histogram. So let's say like the, the y-axis here is counts. 
So there's like some standard processes that produce jets, and that'll produce some you know, number of counts. And that's like the boring stuff, the stuff we already know. What we want to know, is there a new particle with a particular mass that makes jets? And if there was, it would be like a, a localized feature, like a little blip um, at the mass of the particle. So let's say this is the mass of the question mark particle. And so if it exists, if I made a plot like this, I would see like a little bump. That would be like amazing. Um, and I would definitely go to Stockholm for that. Okay. Um, and so, uh, but in practice, we don't get to observe um, the, we don't, I don't know what, what signal and what's background. All I get to observe are the data. Okay, so I see a data, I look, I see this. If I saw this, I'd be pretty happy, honestly. Um, but I wanna know how happy should I be? So I look at this and I say, okay, I wanna do a bump hunt. I wanna ask how big is that bump? Okay, and so usually what I do is I say, okay, let's take a region around the um, supposed bump and I can fit, say, uh, the background to some smooth function that has no bump in it. And then I can ask the question, how likely is it to get a bump given that I expect the background in that region to look like that? And if the data are very inconsistent with the prediction, then I get really excited. Um, uh, I don't own a tuxedo, but I understand I need to wear one when I go accept the Nobel Prize. So I would, I would go out and buy a tuxedo at this point. Okay. Um, uh, now, um, we can make this better by using more features and AI. Okay, so how does that work? So I have my one feature, I called it mass, but it doesn't have to be mass. And then the event that's described by these 10,000 particles or whatever, a lot of particles, uh, has a lot of other features. So I have feature one called mass, and then I have um, a bunch of other features, and n could be very large, n could be like you know, 10,000 or something. Um, and so what I wanna do is I can train a classifier using simulation, synthetic uh, events, um, uh, to distinguish the data from the simulation. And if I, if I do that, I train a classifier and look at the output of the classifier, it will distinguish the signal and background. So it makes the signal look like over here and the background look over here. The classifier is able to distinguish these kind of events. Um, and then I can say, well, let's just keep the signal-like events. So look at events that the classifier says are signal-like and then throw out the rest. So if I do that, I will have fewer events. And ideally what happens is that the background looks exactly the same, just less. Okay, that would be great. Um, and uh, then, basically, if my signal stays the same, my background gets less, I now have more signal to noise, uh, and I can easily find the signal. Okay. But I'd like to increase the signal to noise ratio by making this threshold on the classifier. Okay. Um, but that's not what happens. In reality, what happens is you make a cut on the classifier, and actually you see a huge bump that has nothing to do with signal. So that is the sculpting problem that I want to solve. And now I'm going to briefly explain how it works. Okay. So in summary, in the ideal case, I train my classifier, I place a threshold, I keep only the most signal-like events and toss the rest, and uh, I would get the same shape, but just less. The signal would be the same, the background would go down, signal to noise goes up. Okay. Unfortunately, what happens is I make my cut, and the background doesn't just go down, it also deforms. And sadly, it deforms around the region where there is signal. And looking for a bump on top of a bump is pretty hard. Um, and so we can't do that, basically. Uh, and so this is, we just, it's a no-no, can't do it. We're, 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 um, we're in trouble. Okay, so could I design uh, a neural network architecture or a training procedure that allows me to still separate signal and background but doesn't scope bumps? That's the question I wanna ask. And that is a question that we need tailored solutions to solve. Yes. Yeah, so in this case, um, the way uh, this would work is that you would posit some signal, which is a model we know about, but we haven't observed yet. And then would, you would be able to simulate that you know, hypothetical universe, and we would distinguish that from the standard stuff, and that's how we got this classifier. Uh, but you're absolutely right, uh, and please hold that question for the last part of this, this talk, and then we'll get back to what I'll call anomaly detection, which is, being by, which is like being able to look outside of what we can think about. But in this case, I'm positing a signal, uh, it's a hypothetical signal, but one that's in my, my list of signals. Yeah. Okay. Please feel free to continue interrupting me. Um, I'm happy to be interrupted. Okay. So the solution, or a solution, is to train a classifier in such a way that basically it's not correlated with feature one. So the problem is that all these other features I'm using to train the classifier 
they're slightly related to the mass. And so the neural network is smart. It's basically able to infer the mass from the other features. I didn't give it the mass directly, but it infers it. And so when I say, keep the most signal-like events, it says, well, I'm just going to keep the ones around the mass uh, that you, you told me where the mass is. Okay. Um, so you could just say, well, don't give it the mass. And that's not good enough, because the neural network is smart. It can infer it from all the other um, dimensions. Okay. Um, this is the most complicated picture I'm going to show in this presentation, and I'm going to spend a few minutes describing it. So these are histograms. Uh, the left-hand side, uh, they're both histograms of mass, uh, the, the mass of these, these jet systems. On the left-hand side, the red here is the background. It's just smoothly falling, no in interesting structures. And there's the black here is a signal. So it's an extra source of particles called W bosons. Um, these W bosons are a known type of particle that is like a heavy photon, but uh, you might have a, a new source of them that we didn't know about. Um, and, that's what, and people often look for that. Um, and so let's say you had a search for that, and you would make a picture of the mass. The signal looks like that, and the background looks like that. And the, the, the signal is peaked at the mass of the W boson. Its mass is roughly 80 in these units. The units don't matter. Um, uh, and, and that's where the signal is, and the background has no features. Okay. Now, on the right-hand side, I've trained a classifier, um, and we make a cut and keep only the most signal-like events. And first, I want to draw your attention to the black. So first of all, I should say the right-hand side is only background. There is no signal in this plot. Okay? And the black here is a histogram of what I do in the standard way. I train a standard classifier, make a cut, keep the most signal-like events. And you see the black histogram is peaked at the W boson mass. Okay? There's no signal here. It's just background. So what it did is it said, aha. You want me to keep the most signal-like events? Well, I know that the signal has a mass of 80. So I'm just going to keep the events with a mass of 80. Okay? And that's what it did, basically. Okay, so that's a problem. I can't fit a bump on top of a bump. Okay, so I'm, I'm in trouble. And all these other colored lines are different protocols that um, allow me to train the classifier and not scope a bump. So all these other uh, uh, um, colors, it's the same data. I'm making the same cut, but on a different neural network, a neural network that knows about the problem and doesn't allow me to sculpt. And they have a bunch of different names. Uh, we like to come up with uh, cool acronyms like mode and disco and adversary. Um, and they are different protocols for training. The actual architectures are pretty similar, but the training protocols are different. Like in the actual training of the neural network, we, we're telling it uh, you're not allowed to sculpt the bump in this distribution. Okay. And so we solve this problem, which is great. Um, and the last thing I want to say about the, the subject is that um, this actually highlights an interesting connection. Um, this, problem might seem abstract, this problem might seem abstract to you. It's uh, sculpting and some masses and some spectra. Um, but actually, there's a direct connection to a problem that you probably care about, or I hope you care about, which is fairness. Um, so let's say uh, a recruiter trains a neural network on CVs to say who's the best, um, who's the best candidate. And let's say uh, you want that uh, algorithm to not care about protected features like the age or the sex, the gender, the whatever other background you think is, is should be protected. Um, this is exactly the same problem. Um, so there, you want to decorrelate. You don't want your CV finder to sculpt a bump, if you like, in the white men category, for example. Okay? Um, and so that's exactly the same problem. The difference is that, in our case, it's a continuous spectrum. The mass is a continuous number, and these are usually discrete numbers. Um, but otherwise, it's very similar. And so there's actually kind of an interesting connection between tools developed here for this kind of um, problem that's in our you know, small region of, of, um, of science and, and industrial applications of, of machine learning. And so this is not the only one, but I think it's, it illustrates that the connections can actually go both ways. So developing new techniques here might be useful more broadly, and techniques developed for fairness, you know, once again, can be imported. And so I think this is, this is super cool. And yeah, just, just an aside, basically. OK. So the, the last thing I want to talk about, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about it, is so far I've, I've really said the unique thing about uh, physics, we have simulators, we can do ab initio, simulators are great, um, and they are great. But sometimes there's a good reason not to use them. So in some uh, particular cases, the simulations may not be accurate enough, although they're generally pretty good. There are some regions where they're not good enough. And also, it could be that the simulations encode only the stuff we know about. What if there are things we couldn't even imagine? Um, then we would like to avoid using simulations that were not pegged to whatever you know, our list, our playbook is, basically. Um, and so one area that I want to talk about is anomaly detection. So anomaly detection, for me, means looking for unforeseen things. So new particles or forces in nature that I could not have anticipated ahead of time. 
So the, the summer school here is about theoretical physics. Basically, we are training the next generation of people who are gonna come up with a new theories of, of forces and particles, and they're gonna make the playbook. And the playbook is fantastic. But we also need a way of looking away from the playbook to make sure we didn't miss anything. And I wanna highlight two different kinds of anomalies. So uh, their technical names are called point anomalies and group anomalies. So a point anomaly, which is what most of anomaly detection is about, <coughs> excuse me, um, is where I give you an example and you look at it and you say, it's an anomaly. So let's say like, I don't know, you went to a farm and you saw a flying pig. You would say like, okay, that's an anomaly. Um, okay, you only need to see one to know it's, it's an anomaly. Um, uh, unfortunately, our anomalies are never like that. They're group anomalies. Now a group anomaly would mean that instead of any particular object looking weird, it only looks weird kind of statistically in context. Uh, and so, you know, I'm looking at the barnyard. Is this a weird barnyard? I don't know. I have to know what the distribution of pigs at the barnyard is. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. And so this requires a different class of tools to search for this kind of anomaly. And so to give you some, an example, so this is a picture, a very famous picture, a Nobel Prize winning picture of the discovery of the positron. So uh, uh, around the beginning of the last century, um, uh, Anderson was taking pictures, these photographic plates, and saw there's a particle that looks like an electron, but it's curving the wrong way in the magnetic field. Okay, single event, that's it right there. Okay, you see it curving? Magnetic field applied, it curves, but the wrong way. If it was an electron, it would curve the other way. And so that's weird. Um, that's because it's the positron. Single example anomaly. Okay, we have no, have, we're no longer in that situation, sadly. So now we have a situation like this. This is the discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012. It won the Nobel Prize in, in uh, uh, um, you know, year, some years later. And what this is is a histogram. Um, you can see the theme here, I love histograms. And it's the mass of pairs of photons. And because the Higgs boson decays to photons, I can make the mass of photons, make a histogram, and you see a little bump there. Uh, that was what won the Nobel Prize, that little bump right there, okay. Now no individual event, I can say with certainty, made the Higgs boson. All I can say is that statistically, there's a population of events that look a little weird. Okay, so that is a group anomaly versus a point anomaly. And this is kind of the, the situation that, that we're in. All right, uh, so now I wanna briefly describe sort of the landscape of anomaly detection strategies, and then I'll give you an example. Okay, I like to connect the physics assumption to the machine learning assumption. And really you can categorize different tools based on what's called supervision. And that means what do you tell the model when you train it? Um, so traditional methods are what's called supervised. So you say, here's a picture of a cat, I'm telling you it's a cat. Here's a picture of a dog, I'm telling you it's a dog. And that requires you to know what you're looking for. But if you don't know what you're looking for, you can't do that. Okay, so supervise is not accessible to us for anomaly detection. And these other um, approaches, they have less information. I want to give it, I don't want to tell it what to look for, I want to tell it a little bit what to look for and then let it figure out the rest. Okay, so I'm gonna give you uh, examples of, of unsupervised and weakly supervised. So unsupervised means there's no labels. I just say, here's a data set, find the weird stuff. And the way that these methods work is they try to look, they try to, they try to figure out what is rare. So they figure out um, what are events that are unlikely to occur, and it flags those as anomalies. Okay, and there are many ways of doing that, and one very common way is called an autoencoder. So an autoencoder is a, is a fancy way of constructing a compression algorithm. So you take your data, you compress it, and then you uncompress it, and you, you want the uncompressed thing to be close to the original. Okay, that's what a compression algorithm should try to do. And you train this on the data, and then you say, look for all the events that are not very well reconstructed. So if a compression algorithm is doing its job, it should allocate its capacity to the things that are common. And it should allocate very little capacity to the things that are rare. And so the idea is that you look for the events that the, that the compression algorithm is not very good at, and those are likely to be rare. Okay, so that's a pretty generic and powerful strategy. An alternative strategy is called weakly supervised. So in weakly supervised, I give labels for every example, but they're noisy. Uh, and so one example of that is uh, to look for events that are more likely in one data set relative to another data set. So imagine I have two data sets, and one has uh, some more signal than the other one, that the signal enriched and the signal depleted. And um, I could ask the question, uh, compare these two data sets and find some uh, uh, events that are you know, statistically different be between the two. 
And uh, so there were the weak label, the, the noisy labels comes in is I could say everything in here is labeled signal, and everything in here is labeled background. Those are clearly not the correct labels for every single data point, the balls, um, but they're on average correct, and they give the model enough information to try to tease out small differences. Okay, so here's my, uh, my table. So the physics, the unsupervised, the new stuff is rare. For the, uh, the, the weekly supervised, the signal is more likely than, say, the background. Um, and the main drawback is that for this one, I need two samples. I gotta have what is the reference? What does it mean to be more likely than, than what? Um, and the main drawback of the unsupervised is that you, the, the notion of rarity is not universal. So like, for example, um, let's say I wanna, like, you know, I wanna like, go to the grocery store, and I wanna say, what's an anomalous grocery store visit? Okay, and let's say I'm gonna define it in terms of time. So, okay, I say like, you know, it might take me a certain amount of time to go to the grocery store, and on some day I'd say it takes twice as long, well that's an anomalous, okay? I, had to, I got stopped at all the traffic lights and whatever. But let's say instead of using the time, I, I used gallons of gas. So the gallons of gas depends more on the distance travel and not so much on the time, a little bit, but mostly on the distance travel, right? So it almost doesn't depend on how many times you stop. Um, it'll be about the same. But let's say you had to get routed a different way, then you'd see that would be an anomalous event, right? So a different perspective, way of different, different way of characterizing the, the data, you get a different anomaly, okay? Which may not be a bad thing, but it's, it's a feature. Okay, so the weekly supervised case is uh, very, uh, a common example of that is exactly this, this, this mass, high, high mass question mark particle search I was mentioning earlier. So let me give you that demonstration. Okay, so uh, you've seen this picture before. The, the background is the, the, the stuff we know, it has no features. The signal, if it exists, is a little blip somewhere. And um, uh, so this is generically true if you have a new particle, the particle will be localized, whatever the mass of the particle is. Or imagine you have some time series data and something that's localized in time like you know, some transient thing, then this would be time, and then that would be like when the transient thing happened. So that has like very similar setup, okay. Um, and so I need to generate the noisy labels, and I can do that um, by you know, making a region near the signal and a region away from the signal. And the region near the signal will be my noisy label of signal, and my region away from the signal is my noisy label of background. And so every event gets a label, signal or background, um, and they're almost all background. Um, uh, and in fact, unless I go to Stockholm, they're all background. But, um, uh, but basically, I, I generate these labels, and then I use all the other features to train my classifier. So it's very similar to the example I said earlier with the decorrelation, except here there's no simulation involved. Here I'm training using uh, information in the data from nearby regions, as opposed to using simulations. Um, and here this is shown as a one-dimensional uh, uh, dimension, but I could use all the information. I have 10,000 particles, I have a lot of information I can use to sort of tease out this small feature. Okay, um, and this could be many examples. So, so here's a picture um, uh, of, one, once again, one of these uh, diejet events. This is a picture of the Atlas experiment, it's a transverse view. The protons collide into and out of the page at the middle, and you have these, this is the, the, um, the leak all the cylinders here, and you can see all the particles that are flying out in these two massive sprays of particles, and the question is, does this come from the question mark particle or not, okay? And so I can use the invariant mass of the jets, this is the, the mass of the hypothetical particle if it exists, it would be localized at the mass of the particle, and then I can use the other dimensions, all the properties of these jets, all the information of the distribution of particles in the event and in the jet, in order to tease out, is there something weird or not, okay? So that's, that's one possibility. But this framework is general. It works for any case where I have um, a resonant feature. So another example could be uh, totally unrelated to colliders, which we imagine um, I wanna look for astrophysical objects, new astrophysical objects. Um, and so the example here are these objects called stellar streams. So a stellar stream is a proto-galaxy that's been ripped apart by the gravitational potential of the Milky Way. Here's a picture. That's the Milky Way, and you see these, um, they look like streams. These, these kind of thin, spread out um, sprays of particles that used to be galaxies or proto-galaxies or things like them, and they kind of got spread out over time, okay? And the thing is, they all came from the same cluster of stars, so they're all moving about the same speed or proper motion, and so that is the resonant feature. I could look for a collection of stars that all have roughly, this, moving at roughly the same motion, um, but they differ in a bunch of other ways, okay? And so here, the equivalent of mass is proper motion. Um, so totally different context, but basically exactly the same tools. Um, and 
you can have a, a bunch of background stars, and you can use all the other properties of the stars in order to tease out you know, the, these, these, these stellar streams. Um, I picked this one because it, 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 it makes for better visualizations. The astrophysicists have way better visualizations than the particle physicists, so I had to use this one um, because the colliders are just it's hard to visualize. Okay. Um, so uh, it works. Um, this is an example where we deployed this tool to the Milky Way. Okay, so here's the Milky Way again, and we're looking for this stream called GD1. GD1 is, uh, is a particularly bright stream in the sky, and um, here uh, are stars from that stream uh, 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 identified using a classical method. And the classical method knows about, uh, knows about astrophysics, it knows about a lot of stuff, and uh, it picks out all the stars, okay? And you can see it has a bunch of features, like there's this little line here, and there's some gaps, and okay. And those, those, those gaps and blobs and streaks probably correspond to uh, how it was created. And that's super great because we want to learn something about the structure of the Milky Way. Maybe it tells us about that dark matter I mentioned before. Um, and so we want to understand all these, these substructures here. And this is the same picture, but using a, a neural network. So this neural network knows nothing about astrophysics. All I said was find a region that has a bunch of stars that are localized in their motion. They're kind of moving about the same speed. And they're different in a bunch of different ways. You tell me how. Okay? And it picked out these stars, and you can compare the top and the bottom, and they look pretty similar, which is great. It even found some of the similar structures. But what's pretty, so there's two cool things about this. One is that we can find new streams we didn't know about before. But also, this allows us to label stars as belonging to a stream without assuming something about the astrophysics. The astrophysics requires me to say something about how it was formed. And if I don't know how it was formed, that's the whole point, I want to not assume that, OK? And so here, this is great, because now I didn't tell it about astrophysics. I just said, find me these stars. And in fact, we find stars using the neural network that the classical labeling didn't find, but um, using some other information seemed pretty consistent with the stream. So this allows us to augment the stream uh, uh, membership in order to learn more about the structure of, these, of these, um, these streams. In fact, you can see it. So like this one has a very clean edge. It has a clean edge because basically the algorithm draws a box in some high dimensional space. Okay? That's why it like, has the edge. Whereas this one doesn't have the box, so it's able to have a more kind of you know, fuzzy edge. All right. Um, now we can do the same thing in collider physics. Like I don't have a I don't have a, a beautiful picture. That's why I didn't pick it. But I want to tell you one last little mini story. And the mini story is um, a few years ago we had a data challenge. We called it the LHC Olympics. Uh, so I made this really cool uh, you know logo. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna. It's the problem with copyright. But um, so please, yeah, don't take pictures. No, I'm kidding. You can take pictures. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. You can take pictures. Okay. Um, but just don't send to the LHC, the Olympics, I think in trouble. Okay, um, but we did, I wanted to ask the question, are we ready to be surprised? You know, for, for decades now, we've been doing science by specifying particular hypotheses, looking for those, and rinsing and repeating. But are we prepared to be genuinely surprised, like the positron um, Anderson was you know, 100 years ago? And so what we did is we, we created these black boxes. We made data sets, synthetic data sets, where it was mostly background and maybe some signal. And we didn't tell the people, we didn't tell the, con the, the contestants, the Olympians, what was in the black boxes. And we said, go find what's in the black box, OK? And um, return to us what you think is in there, including what the mass of the particle is that you think is in there. And we had three black boxes. And the first one um, was the easiest one. And here are all the methods. Uh, the names are kind of irrelevant, although you can see this on human neural network. Someone actually tried looking at all the events by eye, and it, it didn't work very well. Okay. Um, uh, and, but these are all um, machine learning based methods. And a few of them actually found the particle, which is really cool. We gave uh, just a list of particles. Here's you know, 10,000 particles, or 1,000 particles, find, find the new stuff. And a few people were able to design algorithms that could find them. Um, the ones that are most successful are these ones in the middle called uh, Tag and Train and, and, and GIS. Okay. Um, and that was amazing. Um, but then we had two more black boxes. And black box two, uh, we didn't put anything in it. It was just background. Um, but everyone thought it was a competition. It's, you know, we, so they all gave us an answer. They said, oh, the particle is here, the mass is whatever. And of course, everyone was pointing in all sorts of different directions. There was no signal to find, right? But they all told us there was some signal anyway. Now, I mean, I'm not that worried about false positive rate, but that wasn't great. But the third black box had a really hard signal. It was a signal that decayed in, a, in two different ways, not just in one way. And no one found it, um, sadly. And so this exercise was really fun um, because it was a blind challenge. We didn't, the, the contestants, they didn't know what they were getting themselves into. And they were very brave at the, the workshop where we gave the answers to go up and, and say what they thought was in there before we told them the right answer. Um, so sociologically, that was fun. Um, but it showed that we have some tools that are very effective, but there also are cases where we haven't solved. And so 
more work is required, and this is a very active area of research. In fact, there are a number of people in the audience uh, who are working on developing new tools to address exactly this problem. And I would say stay tuned. I think this is really over the next five to 10 years, we're gonna see new methods come online, uh, cutting edge methods applied to data, and who knows? We may uh, find the new particles in the forces of nature. Okay, so that basically brings me to the end. Um, uh, I hope I have convinced you that these new AI tools are really um, very useful for physics. We need uh, tailored tools to solve unique challenges in, in particle physics and related areas. And it's not just about improving precision. I think there are really new areas of science, like anomaly detection and other areas, where we, we just couldn't approach it before using classical methods. And there's a whole area of, of new methods being developed by physicists. So in the beginning, Ethan said, this is a school for theoretical physics. And I generally don't like putting on labels, theory, experiment. It's important we have to do it. Okay, theory, experiment. But there's actually a new kind of physicist, a data physicist, who is trying to integrate data and methods in a way to explore um, innovative tools to solve challenges we couldn't solve with traditional methods, using tools from data science and often developing new methods. That's it. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. So we have time uh, for some questions from the audience. In the back there are questions. Uh, well, maybe, uh, maybe I'll bring the microphone. Uh, this is not my area at all, but I have used ChatGPT uh, on a, several occasions. And as your uh, example illustrated, it can come up for wrong answers. Uh, and in many cases, I've seen it come up with very wrong answers. So I'm wondering, how do you correct for th that within whatever algorithms or uh, statistical analysis you're using? Absolutely. So hallucinations are for sure a problem for generative AI. And there's a lot of research to try to improve it. One way that's been uh, explored somewhat uh, in particle physics is you can um, uh, have the model not generate new examples, but point to uh, uh, references and have it give you a reference. It could give you the wrong reference, but at least if it says, here is the, the, you know, the paper you should read or the, the part of the paper you should read, at least what it's giving you is, is factually correct. It just may be out of context. So there are tools like that where you can kind of combine you know, information and citation in order to kind of improve their fidelity. But it's, it's really an open area um, to, to decrease hallucinations. Yeah, great talk. Uh, thank you so much. So I'm sh sure many of us were paying attention to the news. You know, remember, what was it, like 10 years or five, 10 years ago, something like that. There was a, you know, a whole bunch of media hype over like, what, a three or four sigma bump that turned out to be complete noise. And I guess like um, my immediate question for this is the moment that we start being able to look for things that we aren't expecting, how are we, or are we, or how do we, does this just make the, these sort of events more likely? Like already we have to go to five or six sigma to be certain that something is not just a hallucination with our current methods. Does this basically mean that you need 10 sigma or something um, that's, that may be completely unattainable in order to actually detect anything new? If there's, or if we have methods that are looking around for, or if there's no priors on the methods that we're using? Yeah, that, that is an excellent question. Um, the, the statistical terminology would be the trials factor. And uh, if you were to scan over all of the different dimensions, these 10,000 dimensions, you would for sure find every, you'd find a lot of stuff. That would be, not, be garbage, basically. Um, but these methods, that's one of the requirements. They have to be designed in a way such that they don't have a crazy trials factor, so that if you report three sigma of an excess, it's three sigma of an excess. And so we've done a lot of work to try to calibrate that. So one exercise is the LHC Olympics to check. You know, uh, We know how much we injected, how much sigma, like did they find that amount? Um, but also, um, there's a lot of, of, of work going into uh, uh, not only the data challenges, but trying to understand in, in simulations like the statistical properties of these tools. And in, in, for the most part, it's, it seems like it's under control. We have ways of, of making sure that we're not just like, you know, uh, inflating, um, you know, the, the false positive rate. And so that's, that's like a critical, so when I say new methods, the new methods have to have that property. If they don't have that property, then it's no good. Um, yeah. This is so much fun, thank you. Um, 
I, so I'm, I, I was delighted to see that y you gave the astrophysics example. And I just wonder, I mean, uh, a lot of fields of physics have lots of dimensions and have been working in the kind of way that you do. Who else is working on this? What are the other fields besides the astrophysics that you saw that uh, it has a lot of op opportunities? Um, how, how big can this go? Absolutely, so I think basically everyone can use machine learning. Uh, it's gonna revolutionize everyone. Um, the particle physics examples, and to some extent the astrophysics ones, are really good examples uh, for where the cutting edge is because the data problem is so extreme. There's basically no way of answering some of these questions classically. Um, so, uh, I mean, the, 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 the data set size, for instance, the Large Hadron Collider, is not matched by any other um, experiment yet. Now that is changing. Um, there are a number of experiments coming online uh, not just in physics, but in you know, biology and chemistry that are generating huge data sets. Um, and so um, now they may not have simulations, and so it's kind of a different regime, but absolutely we're gonna see um, these kinds of tools deployed everywhere in science. Um, but they might have different uh, requirements. Um, for instance, if you're sequencing, you may not have too many sequences, but each individual data point is huge. Um, whereas here you have a ton of events, and each event is a bit smaller, um, and you know simulations versus not. But uh, ultimately, we can tailor the tools that we need to solve the problems. Just a, just a second for the microphone. Do you have a number on the uh, like a? They're suggesting GPT-5 is going to be a 10 trillion parameter data set. Like, do you, do you have a number that you're referring to as far as the the Large Hadron? Collider, what's you know what what is the output is what, what's that number? Yeah, so um, yeah, kind of like state of the art right now for language models is yeah, it's hitting like you know a trillion parameters. That's a huge model, but that is tiny compared to the size of the data set. Now, now GPT-4, for instance, <coughs> was trained on like what is it like one or ten percent of the whole internet? I don't know if it's probably it's not public, um, and I don't, I don't know how big that is actually, but that could be kind of in the same ballpark, maybe even bigger. Um, there's different ways of measuring how much data we have. Because it turns out, for another lecture, uh, actually at the Large Hadron Collider, we throw almost all the data away in real time. Um, and so everything I talked about today is about offline data analysis, but there's a whole complementary thing with like, how did you do it online, like in real time? And if you could do that, the data set would be way bigger. Um, but uh, how does this compare, our data set size compared to say the training data set of chat GPT, or GPT-4 or GPT-5? I don't know. I mean, part because it's not public, but um, uh, it's like it's not it's not tiny, but like compared to the whole internet, it's it's not bigger than the whole internet. Um, yeah, yeah, bigger than all of science though, and we don't have the resources that Google has, so um, it's part of our challenge. When we are working with the classification, there would always be some false positive and false negative rates. Mm -hmm. At which points does this become useful for you? How much of the false positive rate you could tolerate? Yeah, absolutely. So. So when I was talking about making like a threshold, for instance, uh, I don't know if I can get back fast enough, but I was talking about like training a classifier, uh, for instance, making a threshold. Um, more or less, what you want to do is so there's, you have the true positive rate and the false positive rate, but there's um, you can also ask what is the signal to noise ratio, um, and that um, there's you can ask is that go up, and if that goes up, then we're happy, um, and ideally it goes up as much as possible, and so. Typically, we don't just look at the trade-off between the true positive and the false positive. What we really care about is what's the signal-to-noise ratio, which, in terms of those two numbers, is the true positive rate divided by the square root of the false positive rate. The noise is like the square root of the number of the background, which is like the shot noise. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, as you said, to truly be surprised by AI, we kind of have to make it forget everything that we know. Um, so how can you make sure that the reward um, mechanisms for this neural network are unbiased with um, the theory that we know already? Yeah, we all first, by, first start by saying that there's of course a whole spectrum. We want it, on the one end, we want it to know nothing. On the other end, we want it to know, you know everything. And there's a whole slew of, of methods and they kind of trade off breadth and depth. Like the more you tell it, the, more, the better it is, but for only the things you know about, and then you know the whole trade off. But so for the example I gave here, um, this, this like anomaly detection strategy where you, um, let's say this one, um, you, um, uh, you use like the, the sideband to train the classifier, you basically don't tell it anything. Um, we only tell it that if there is something, it's localized there, and that the background is just smooth. Like you can, it's just a continuous continuation from the side. And so that's pretty minimal. Uh, now we do have to assume that there is something new at that spot, and we're maybe gonna scan over where that spot is. Um, and the more places we look, the, the trials factor, that you know, the more experiments you make, the more likely you're to find something, so you don't wanna look too many places. 
Um, but that's a way of kind of minimizing the information we give it. And ultimately, we're going to need a whole slew of tools that are kind of spanning the no information and all the information to, to be broadly sensitive. Maybe I'll ask a question. Um, so c can you tell me a little story to help me understand a little better? When you, when you talk about maybe we should be prepared for surprises, we'll see things we never expected to see, what, 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 what might that look like? We found a particle with a mass that no theory had predicted, or what, what sort of thing would, would come out of it? Yeah, so I think there's two kinds of things that these anomaly detection strategies are very good at. On the one hand, there's like totally nuts things, things that like, yeah, there are particles that are, like, decay in ways we didn't think to look for. Um, that's one possibility. So the example, um, like in the, this LHC Olympics, uh, uh, I passed it, uh, this one. So what was in here was um, uh, some new particle that decayed in a, in a, in a strange way. Uh, it had a, a, a massive particle that decayed to other massive particles that decayed um, into a, a weird number of quarks. That, that's what this model was. Um, so that's one type of anomaly. Another strategy that these are very useful for is imagine you have a theory that has a lot of parameters. And there's no way I could, you know, I could do all the searches. Now, roughly speaking, it takes one graduate student five years to do a search. Okay? And let's say you have 100 parameters. Um, that, I don't have enough grad students for that. right? Um, and so anomaly detection, though, doesn't care about how big the model is. Right? It can just search the whole space kind of holistically. And so that is another you know, kind of use case. Even though like, at any point in the parameter space, you could like, specify the model and find it. But if the parameter space is too big, then you might want to automatically look everywhere. I just had a quick question. When you show that astronomical data, uh, and you said, sort of vaguely said, what, how did you train that? Uh, did you train it at all to look for specific you know, kinematics, like a certain direction of motion or something? Or is it really just pulling that out of nowhere? Yeah, so what we do is we say, um, we, we look at the proper motion. In one, there's two proper motions that way and that way on the sky. And so we pick one of them. And we say, uh, look at a region in proper motion. And I'm going to eventually scan over that region. But for a given region, I construct the signal region and the sideband region, the dark gray and the light gray. And then I use all the other features of the stars to train the classifier. And that's it. Uh, and then it, the, the, the model said, OK, there's a collection of stars in this region that uh, look weird in all these other properties, in the other motions, in the, their, um, their spectra, um, you know, yada, yada. And it picked out those stars. That's the red stars. Here's a question up here. Oh, OK. Maybe one more question. Oh, okay. um, I, so how big are your models? How big are the simulations? Like if you had, I don't know, 10 times as much funding or something? I mean, are you, what, 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 what are the limits and, and sizes? Please give us 10 times more funding. That would be great. <laughs> um, so the models that we're talking about here are not huge. So for instance, like the biggest models that we train have like hundreds of millions uh, up to a billion, I would say, like uh, events. Um, and the models are like, um, like the biggest ones are probably, yeah, tens to hundreds of millions of parameters. Um, yeah. We can definitely scale up, and the bigger we go, the better. Um, but I would say right now that's not the limiting factor. The limiting factor is more on the methodology side than on the scaling side. All right. Well, this has been uh, very interesting, but I think I don't want to hold uh, everyone here all night. So let's uh, please thank uh, Dr. Nachman again for a wonderful talk. <laughs>